we'll jump right in here. He asked me a couple weeks ago, of course, Timothy, if you weren't here last week, um, man, he did a great job with that piece of scripture and, and that honor in our husbands and wives and submission and things of that nature, how, how unity in marriages is a huge deal and, and it's a give and give uh, situation, not a give and take situation. And, and today, hopefully, we're going to look at sort of the natural progression of how marriage works and and how it relates to children and parenting. Um, when when he said, hey, I need for you to speak for me while I'm gone, and he told me what I was going to be speaking on, I'm like, dude, you could take all of Scripture, and there might be two other verses that I would say, not that one, don't, don't make me do that, but that's the way it works out, so here we are. So um, I told him, I said, I'll give him the extent of my wisdom, so, so here's the extent of my wisdom, okay? You, you parents and young parents and those are going to be, uh, pray all you can. Teach them that with choices come consequences. Let me know how that works out. We'll be dismissed. Let's pray. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much what I got, you know. Um, Mark Twain. I'm going to start with a little funnier too, okay, Gary, because i am probably be way too serious for this. Over with. Mark Twain said that the best way to raise a child was to put it in a water barrel and put a lid on it and feed it through the hole. Till it became a teenager. And then when it became a teenager, plugged the hole. <laughs> that was probably... <laughs> he sold a lot of books, so maybe he knew. People got a lot of ideas on how to raise children and what to do and the way that that works. And, of course, I'm a big Andy Griffith fan. Anybody here big Andy Griffith fan still? My grandson, he's like, really pop Andy Griffith again. I'm like, yeah, I, I do know the words to all of them, but yeah, you know. If you remember, uh, Andy ran into a hobo who was down by the river, and the kids were down there with him, and they were talking about stuff, and the hobo had told Andy, he's just let Opie decide for himself what he wanted to do. The boy just needs to decide for himself how he wanted to live. And Andy said this in Andy's wisdom. No, you can just see him. I'm afraid it don't work that way. You can't let a young and decide for himself. See, he'll grab at the first flashy thing with shiny ribbons on it, and then when he finds out there's a hook in it, it's too late. Wrong ideas come packaged with so much glitter that it's hard to convince them that other things might be better in the long run. All a parent can do is say, wait and trust me and try to keep the temptation away. In, in the world that we live in now, it seems like a lot of that has gone by the wayside. How many of you here feel this morning like you're qualified to be parents? Joanne, come on now. Pretty still pretty big crowd. How many of us who have uh, seen several of Lonnie's Frosty Mornings feel like we could have done a better job as parents? Reckon? You, you, you young guys, y'all see that? Y'all hey, look, you, I'm just saying. If we ask ourselves a question, what's the responsibilities of a parent, what would those answers be? Everybody's got a different answer. Uh, Kim and... Mike and Leanne and myself joked for years that what we wanted our children to be were uh, productive citizens of the community. That we wanted to be contributing members of the community. You know, if we'd done that, we'd done our job, right? Thankfully, that worked out really well. <laughs> so we're glad of that. But I've always kind of added to the same thing with Aaron. I'm like, I pick at her. I'm like, I also want you to be successful enough to be able to take care of me when I'm old. So if you will, just keep working. That that will work out pretty good. But we look this morning, we say, what are the biblical responsibilities of parents? And, and we're going to look at some of that, if I can still work this. There you go. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4 says this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of of the Lord. Now, in going to the regular progression, we were talking about what Timothy was building on last week with marriage. The, the marriage in itself is the covenant keeping relationship between Christ and the church. Marriage is a living example of the way Christ loves the church and how we are to love one another. And that's what people see in that. If we look, as Timothy said last week, in Ephesians 5 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives 
as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for. Three things in three verses. Verse 23, even as Christ is the head of the church. Verse 24, as the church submits to, to Christ. Verse 25, as Christ loved the church. So what's the most important meaning of marriage as we look at it? What the most important meaning of marriage as we look at it is as Christ, as the church, as Christ. It's a living example in our lives that people can see on a daily basis that we are to love one another the way Christ loves our church. Make a statement to you today that sounds, we, we know that God had intended originally for children to be brought into the world through the marriage covenant, right? That's what he intended. But it's not, the marriage covenant is not just for making children, but it's for making children disciples of Christ. Okay? It's the, the ultimate goal here is to fill the world full of worshipers. We, his original plan, of course, was procreation, but it's not just to increase the number of heads on the planet, it's to increase the number of Christ followers on the planet. Now, let me say this. I realize, and I think all of us realize, that not everyone has the ability to bring children into the world for whatever reasons. You know, there's lots of reasons for that, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that married people unable to have children or single people, which is very biblical, that doesn't have children, doesn't have the ability to help increase the number of followers of Christ. It gets back to the point that we said before. You, the main goal here in our lives is to spread the gospel. Is to spread the gospel. Having children, if we look at it biblically, is God's will. He's made that very clear. But it's not an absolute. Marrying, marriage, everybody's not called to marriage. It's not an absolute. If you do get married, it's not an absolute that God calls everybody to have children. If you've got some of your older folks in your family go, you should be having maybe. Well, that, maybe, okay? But not to everybody. It, it's okay. It's not an absolute calling. Having kids is, has, never been, uh, has never stopped being a good thing. We know Scripture tells us in like Psalms 2, uh, 127, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children's one use. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks it with his enemies in the gate. In the New Testament in Mark, it says they were bringing children to him that he might touch him, and the disciples rebuked him. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. So from the beginning to the end, the Bible puts a big value on having and raising and blessing children. But another point I want to make is, again, it's not an absolute. If we look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So everybody stands on that and they say, we should get married, right? Everybody should find a partner and get married. But then we look forward in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, an unmarried Paul says this. I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Marriage is not an absolute. God says it's okay. If, if we're single or for whatever that reason, for whatever reason is, there are different gifts and different callings for different reasons at different times. So it's the same thing with, with conceiving children. We know that God said, be fruitful and multiply, right? There was a reason for that at that time. But it's not absolute. What is absolute is that we should pursue spiritual children in our culture. Whether they belong to ourselves, whether we created them physically, whether they came to us some other way. No matter who we are, what our marital or our parental status is, we should be committed to teaching the gospel to children everywhere. For some people, that looks different. It could be through adoption. It could be through foster care. It could be through making your home a place for a backyard Bible club or Sunday school class, a nursery job. 
It could ha- you could have nieces or nephews or great nieces or great nephews or whatever that looks like. That responsibility of pursuing spiritual children in our culture is what's placed on all of us, no matter if we are labeled parents by society or not. Listen, you've heard, several of you have heard me make this statement several times. It is hugely important that we put the gospel and our faith to the next generation. If we don't, where are we? We're literally, this church is one generation away from closing. Don't kid yourself. Don't think it can't. Don't think it can't. It's up to us to be intentional. We were having a little conversation this morning about being intentional, not just about the gospel, but I think one of the things that we've forgotten as as Christians because of some of the things that society and, and nature has thrown at us through COVID and all this other stuff, is we've forgotten that it's okay to invite people to church with us. We, we've, we've forgotten to be intentional just about saying, hey, there's a great group of people that I go to church with. I've got a man that stands in this pulpit and takes care of the word. He's not going to be judgmental of you. He's going to tell you what scripture says in context to the people it was written to at the time. And oh yeah, and by the way, we've got some really cool musicians up there. I'm not one of them. But there's some really cool musicians that do a great job singing. And you might enjoy yourself. We'd love for you to come. And what is it that Tim Adams said for years and years at this church? It's been proven that 100 people, 100% of the people that you bring to church will actually come. So we need to be intentional about, about bringing them, asking them. Romans 9 says in verse 8, It's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. In other words, the kids that were brought into the kingdom, those are the ones God is in, intentional about. So let's look at that parenting aspect of bringing children into the world and what that says. As we looked at our first scripture, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and you may live along in the land. Believe it or not, we live in a society that is beginning to admire disobedience and rebellion. You think? It's, it's rampant. It's on social media. It's on television programs. It's on movies. It, it, how many times... If you really think about it now, okay, before y'all start throwing rocks, and that's okay if you do. How many television shows and movies you see where parents are portrayed as clueless morons that don't know anything about anything, you know? I, I see some of these things, and I look at it. Matter of fact, matter of confession, I'm step out this way so I don't get struck by lightning. There's some shows we watch sometimes. Uh, the, um, there's a show that was on Netflix called Outer Banks. And, and I don't know if you've seen it. It was, it was well-written, and it was inter- entertaining. But Tim and I would watch it. We'd have the conversation. These are 16-year-old kids. Where are their parents? You know, how did, they, how did they have the keys to all this stuff? How did they stay gone for two days at a time, and nobody wants to know where they are, you know? But you've got to remember, you've got an entire generation of people from the eight, and I'm just going. I'm, this is not personal. Don't any of y'all take this personal. From the ages of thirty down, that look at this and say, eh, "Maybe it's okay." It's not okay. It's not. We've been told a lie. But as a, as individuals, we value independence, and, and really, let's just be honest. There's a lot of us that are super independent that resent anybody telling us what to do. Wait, did you see my finger point at Linda? I'm sorry. You should have done that. Parents are being disregarded, disrespected. Now, we're going to get into some shaky ground here, so just, just hang on, okay? Don't, don't. Part of this is the fault of parents. We know that. There's times that in life, I'm waiting on the filter. That sometimes we're too soft with our kids because we don't want to break their spirit. We want them to have things better than we had it. You hear constant yelling at the house that's three doors up or apartment three doors up, and you're in my favorite and all y'all's favorite too. Let's be honest, don't lie about it. Your favorite is in you're in the grocery store and little little Johnny's running around and he's tearing down boxes and he said, Johnny, stop, Johnny, stop, Johnny, 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 Johnny. Pretty soon you're ready to throttle Johnny. Okay? It's not okay. I mean, because 
that's, that's just one of those things that, you know, sometimes in this, in this era that we live in today, it's absentee fathers. They're just not in the family like they once were. Makes you understand a little bit why there is disrespect. And obedience is becoming an old-fashioned idea. See, even in today's society, when we say the word obedience, that sounds like, well, who's going to tell me what to do? I ain't listening to nobody. Do what you want to do when you want to do it. In this particular scenario, God's Word teaches us to obey and honor. Now listen to this. In Exodus 20, chapter 12, uh, chapter 20, verse 12, excuse me. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. We're going to come back to that in a minute. This is how God wanted the families of Israel to function, and God was really, really serious about this. And you say, how so? Okay. Look in Leviticus, chapter 20. For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood is upon him. Let's move one more. This is really small, and I'm sorry. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. Are y'all seeing this? And they shall say to the elders of his city, This is our son. Is stubborn. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. That pop on the bottom is looking pretty good right now, right? So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now there's a discipline technique for you. I mentioned before, some of us are worried about breaking a kid's spirits by giving them a little pop and things of that nature. It says here, purge the evil. I don't know about some of you, but my daddy was a phenomenal guy at purging the evil. <laughs> Wouldn't tolerate it. Tom Lee Jones says, don't tolerate it. But let me just offer this to you. This is just a little of that fryism stuff y'all were afraid was going to show up. There's two types of behavior in this world. You know what they are? acceptable and unacceptable. And how does a child know the difference? Whose responsibility is it to show them the difference? It's our parent. It's their parents. There's two types of, two types of behavior, acceptable and unacceptable. Now, we're talking about raising them in the spirit of the Lord, okay? So there's ways to do this. We'll get in just a minute. First of all, when we look at this verse of Scripture, let's say this, one, let's say this out loud. Th these are not kids. Okay? These are not young children. They're young adults. They, di they didn't just go out and throw rocks and stones at eight and nine-year-olds. Furthermore, eight and nine-year-olds weren't gluttons and drunkards. If your eight-year-old child is a drunkard, you're a really bad parent. Okay? Let's just be honest about that. So the, the people that we're talking about here are older. So once you get them up to where they can, you know, feed themselves and clothe themselves and get in the truck, yeah, you're not done. We're not done. I'm not done. I right, am 30 years old. I still ain't done. Kim and I still aren't done. Some of y'all in that same boat too. Love it. Wouldn't trade it for the world. But that whole thing of if I can just get you to 18, it's really not the way that works. We need to understand this is serious. We also know that we look at the promise attached to this command so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. We're so tuned to being individuals, and when we look at Scripture from an individual perspective, we say to ourselves, hey, if I honor my parents like I should, I'll live to be really old. Right? Some of us looked at that for years and thought, as long as I listen to mom and dad, I'm good. That's not what this is talking about. This is, they're talking about this, the, the Scripture's talking about this, that... He's talking to them as a community. Obedience to an authority is cultural. And it's biblical. There's headship in everything we look about about God. He's at the, he's at the top. Obedience is part of that. 
Authority is cultural and it's important for society. The promise of you may live long in the land is that we're reading from the book of Exodus. You remember what these rascals went through? How many times they screwed up? What he's saying is it's important for you to listen to me and to obey what I'm asking you to do, not for my own good, but for yours. It's important. When we talk about authority and listen to authority and culture, how many of us in here answers to absolutely nobody in your life? Anybody? Okay. If that's been the case, if kids don't respect authority and we don't teach them to respect authority when they're little, let me tell you what we're doing. We are raising unteachable, uncoachable, unemployable citizens who will someday be somebody else's parent and they will raise more unteachable, uncoachable, unemployable people. And this society is headed in a downward trend. Uh, here, here's something else that I'll just, I'll just offer to you that doesn't cost you any extra. Teens make bad decisions. Okay? They will. If you think your teenager is capable of making quality decisions, you need to rethink that. There's an old saying that uh, a friend of mine, well, it's T.A., I used to say this a lot. If you can't make good decisions, I'll make them for you till you can. There's a reason for that. God said, if your long-term place in the land is going to last, you need to do what I'm asking you to do when it comes to obeying your parents and honoring your parents. Not when you're just younger, but also when you're older. It's a serious situation. And when the honor to our parents disappears, that means that our honor to God will probably follow. And that will follow by our land disappearing, in this case, or in today's society, that would be our culture. Our culture will continue to spiral downward into a place where we don't recognize it anymore. Nobody wants that. When the societal structures are breaking down, especially the family structures, the land was taken away. God is still serious about this, these commandments today about honor and obey. It's repeated in the New Testament. In Matthew it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, honor your father and mother, so that it may go well with you and you might enjoy a long life on the earth. If we look at it, there may be questions that come up and say, Okay, Fry, well, what if the parents are wrong? What, you know, there are bad parents in the world, right? We all know somebody that's had a bad situation. That maybe has to do with perspective. I try not to have more than one quote by one person in one lesson, but another Mark Twain quote was, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much that old man had learned in seven years. Might be a surprise to some kids, but as parents, we, we do know a few things. Was it Bill Dance, I think, said, bad decisions come from lack of experience, and experience comes from making a lot of bad decisions. So it takes a few years to, to actually do that so we can do it. We do get it wrong, parents. We do. We all have some regrets. We all know that there's times we've really messed up. Hopefully, when we get them wrong, we're humble and enough to have a conversation if our child's old enough to understand and explain that we're not perfect people. The truth is, the way we handle when we mess up is where some of that respect is built. I believe when you have a child that's able to have that conversation, you're not setting a precedent by saying, hey, I made a mistake, I need you to forgive me. Yeah, they may bring it up and say, well, you was wrong about so-and-so. Maybe I was, but I'm not wrong about this. And the answer to that question is, if I'm wrong again, I'll apologize too. But until that point, I'm your dad, I'm your mom. This is the rule. Okay? This is, this is the way we do it. That's the way we build respect. Commands from God are designed to help us have the freedom to enjoy God and what he gives us. Look at Christ. He gave us the example. He's a 12-year-old boy. He's in Jerusalem. He's teaching. He's just absolutely wowed the temple with what he knew, right? And what happens? Uh, Jesus' parents make a little mistake, right? 
One thought one had him, the other thought the other one had him, and they look up, and suddenly they say, where's Jesus? So they have to go back and get him. And so when they say, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And the next thing that the Scripture tells us, it says, then Jesus went down to Nazareth with him and was obedient to them. He just shocked the world in the temple with his knowledge of everything. But 12-year-old Jesus did what? His mom and dad asked him to do. So what we're seeing in Jesus is this. If you can't honor your parents who you can see, how on earth will we teach anybody to honor a God that we can't? You see how all that works together? Obedience to parents leads to freedom. The freedom of knowing who God is and how that works in all types of situations. Not all homes are alike. I get that. Not all homes are alike. Some of us have grown up in a Christian home. We're surrounded by Christian example and influence. And through our parents, we saw the love of God displayed to each other and displayed to us. And that's how we saw who God was and how he loved us. I was fortunate enough to live in one of those houses. But what about you grow up in a house that don't know Jesus? You become a Christian later in life. You can still look at your parents and honor them because you realize now because of who you, your love through, of God and through God that they're not believers, and you have the freedom of knowing that God is a freedom that drives you to care and love for them, even though you may have been mistreated, even though you may have been neglected. What if you grew up in a hurtful, an abusive home, and then you became a Christian? Well, see, God gives you the freedom to forgive them, just as he forgave you. And so the recognition of how that works is huge. It all comes back to the relationship with God. Growing in God, seeking to put His obedience into practice in your own circumstances. So that covers the kids. Let's look at parents. A few observations about what that verse of Scripture has. Go back to the top. There it is. The father has a leading responsibility in bringing the children up into discipline and instruction of the Lord. Verse 1 says, children, obey your parents both. But when the focus shifts from the duty of children to the duty of parents, the father is mentioned, not the mother. What this shows is the continuation that we've seen since Genesis of a headship, of somebody in charge being the leader. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers have a leading responsibility in bringing up the children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Secondly, both mother and father are called to this together. Both are mentioned as the special object of the child's honor. Honor your father and mother. In Proverbs uh, chapter 6, verse 20, it says this, My son, keep your father's commandment, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always and tie them around your neck. Paul reminded Timothy to hold fast to what his mother and grandfather has told him as a child. So both mother and dad bear the responsibility in a marriage to bring the children up in the Lord, but dad has the leading responsibility. Thirdly, it's important that mom and dad be united in the, in the effort of raising the kids and raise them in the, in the nurturing and admonition of the Lord. I realize that's not always possible because sometimes you have different households where one spouse is a believer and one's not. That creates an issue. I get it. But hopefully there's a way that you can find a, a common ground so that the children are disciplined, that the, the, the ground rules are open and everybody understands. Don't confuse the kids. Work through your differences over what to teach, when to discipline. Stand united in front of your kids. Let me say this, and I'm not getting in your business. Don't let kids manipulate you. Don't let them manipulate you against one another. Stand together. It's big. God is one person. Young parents, let me say this, and this is going to, uh, well, I'm just going to say it. 
You are not running for popular office. You are not running for a vote. Okay? When kids start to manipulate you and try to do that, you, you need to un- make them understand, look, I understand this is not popular with you. I understand this is not making you happy. In the Fry household, my brother and I have a little saying. This will shock you, I know. We would have said to our kids on a regular basis when we make a decision that's unpopular, I'm mad at you, I don't like it, this ain't fair. Okay, there's two things you can do about it. Like it and nothing. End of the list. And the reason I say it that way is not because I'm the authority, not because I'm superpower, it's because hopefully I've prayed about that decision, I understand this is the best for my kids. And at some point you just have to say, I'm sorry, this is just the way it is. Again, going back to, if I make a mistake, we'll have that conversation. And we'll make it right. It's a, the fundamental task of a mother and dad is to show God to our kids. Children know their parents before they know God. Think about that. It's a huge responsibility. And, and actually, I, got, I read this in something that John Piper made the statement. He said, every parent should be desperate for a God-like transformation. Your children will have years of exposure to what the universe is like before they know there even is a universe. They will see that through you. They will experience the kind of authority there is in the universe and the kind of justice there is in the universe and the kind of love there is in the universe before they ever meet God. Children are absorbing from Dad his strength, his leadership, his protection, justice, love. From Mom, they're getting her care, her nurture, her warmth, her intimacy, justice, and some of these overlap. All this happens before the child knows anything about God, but it's profoundly about God because we are set forth as that example. The chief task we have as parents, the number one thing we have as parents to to accomplish is to show children who God is and the attributes he has and to help them see who God is and to accept him and to have a relationship with him. Lastly, to that point, to that part there. God's ordained both mother and father to be involved in raising... Let me say one other thing. Let me back up. Here's just a little piece of advice for some of you younger folks. Dads, young dads, young husbands, listen. If you come home and mom's lit up and she says, I want you to know what your child just did. That's not the way Kim said that. I'm just saying, please don't take that that way. Usually when I came home and I saw the face, I would say, what's wrong? Your daughter. No matter what has happened, even if you don't think she made the right call, dads, back her. Back her up. Y'all can talk about it later when they're asleep. You can attack it in a different way at a different time. Worst mistake you'll ever make is for a child to be able to have the ability to look at their mom and say, Daddy said you was wrong. Don't do that. Don't do that. We should both be involved. Show them the love of the church. So what's supposed to happen with our kids? In the text that Paul refers to parents in verse 1, then shifts to the focus of fathers in verse 4, and it says, both mother and father. We might expect old Paul to go, uh, when he starts and says, parents, do not provoke your children to anger, because that's what he said earlier, right? He said, parents, obey your parents in the Lord. But when he got to verse 4, he didn't say parents, he said fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger. That's because we go back to what I said earlier. Dads, we have a leading responsibility in the house in parenting these kids. Not a sole responsibility, just the the lead. Back in Ephesians 5, Paul said the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for. God doesn't make the husband the leader in the relationship to his wife and then make the wife the leader in raising these kids. That's the natural progression of this leadership. See, that's what it means to be a loving, sacrificial, married man that takes the responsibility for headship in that relationship to our wives 
to have a loving, tender, firm relationship when it comes to the kids. It's not simple. So how do we do that? Brian, you got all these questions, you got any answers? I'm not so sure. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he won't depart from it. Years ago, our, our kids wouldn't be what they are today without my bride. That's just all there is to it. But along with my bride was a man named James Dobson. And you can say what you want to. James is an older gentleman. And, and, and you know, it's been, I, don't, I guess he's still alive. I, I, I didn't even look at that before. I think he's still alive. He had some health issues. But some of his advice got us through raising some of our kids. But he helped me with this passage more than anything I've ever heard. You see, most of you know that's listened to me any at all. I'm a big believer in spiritual gifting. I believe that everybody should operate inside their spiritual gift. And I think the only way that we have teachers and leaders in churches and people that fill positions and stay committed to them and enjoy them and do a good job is if they're in fact working inside their spiritual gifting. And God does give a gift to all of us. It's, it's integral to our faith. So when it says train up a child in the way we go, let me ask this question. Are we raising our child to be honoring to each other, to their parents? Are we instilling in them the values of sharing lives with another flawed human being when we get back to that marriage thing? Remember this. We are raising adults. You are not raising children. We are not raising children. We are raising adults. And those adults will be somebody's future spouse, somebody's employee, Somebody, some leader in this church, somebody else's mom or dad. For years and years now, and this culture makes it even worse. Everything that we have now for our kids is tailored strictly, strictly to them. Everything. You know, we, there's memes and stuff about um, traveling, and, you know, used to when we were kids, what radio, we went on vacation in 1978. You know what radio station we listened to? Whatever my daddy said we was listening to. My car, my radio, okay? And, and some of us who have seen, who have got grandkids of our own now, we might have been lucky, you know, except for the technologically advanced like Micah when he was young. We might have had a Walkman or something, you know, that's pretty much it. But we, we listened to sort of what radio played and you had to wait on different stuff. And some of us who lived through eight tracks, oh my, you had to go through a bunch of stuff you didn't want to listen to just to get to the songs you wanted to listen to. But now today, think about this. Dude, your kids, our kids, our grandkids don't even have to watch commercials if they don't want to. Okay? You, they just don't. So think about it. These children today, our, our grandchildren and grandparents, I'm going to get on you in just a minute. We, we look at this and we see they have tablets, telephones, iPods, iPads. If, not that these things are bad. Don't give me the stink eye. They're not bad. Okay? But think about this. They spend their entire life. My grandson, and he's not here this morning, but if he was, I'd look straight in his face and just tell him. I mean, the dude can sit and watch 7-on-7 seven seven football on his phone for hours. Hours. And never look up. Headphones in. Nothing in the world going around. It's all about what he wants to watch, when he wants to watch it, and how he wants to watch it. Our granddaughter will come to, the, to a meal, and the first thing she sets down is her tablet. We're like, nope, let me have that. Okay. You say, okay, Fry, you're beating us dumb. What's it about? Here's what it's about. We spend our entire lives as kids with all this electronics, all these gadgets. They're doing what they want to do, when they want to do it in their room, listening to the music they want to listen to, when they want to listen to it, watching the tablet they want to watch, the shows they want to watch, the YouTube videos they want to watch, not having to deal with advertisements or any interruption whatsoever in a world that's solely their own until they're 21. And then we say, oh, by the way, Find yourself a soulmate, and you two people that have lived the same lives who have never shared anything in your life, come together and get along. And then we wonder why the divorce rate is crazy. Are we raising our kids and our grandkids to be adults who can share with another person? Do they honor and respect another person's space? Do they honor and respect the fact that there's another flawed individual that they're going to have to live life with? Those are hard questions. And no, I don't have all those answers. Dads, in order for us to lead, we have to be present. We have to be involved. We have to be committed enough to not look only at the spiritual gifts in this kid's life, but when this says train up a child in the way he should go, 
even when he's old and not depart from it. James Dobson helped me to understand that, look, we should be able to know our kids well enough. We should be in our, li- our kids' lives so well that we understand what their inclinations are to be things in the world. What are their gifts and talents that will enable them to succeed in life? Should they be in something that's accounting or construction or, or welders or whatever that is? But we should know them well enough to be able to say, Hey, buddy, this may be what you won't look at. You know, I know you do this well. And this profession right here will give you the understanding to, to be able to use your gifts and, and do that well. My brother and I had a conversation years and years ago. We, we compare notes sometimes. and He made the statement about that. He said, you know, he got an example from somewhere. But he was talking about when we know our kids, we should know it like, how many of you fly? Well, we ain't flown lately, right? But you've flown, right? So who's the most important person in that plane? The pilot. And we want him to know what? We want him to know everything. That dude that's sitting up there with his nose on the windshield, we want him to know every creak and groan that plane makes. We want him to know what every single red and yellow button on that cockpit stands for and what it does and how to make it go off. We want to know if he knows the direction that we're supposed to go in, what the weather's like. Is he going to give us a good flight or is he going to bounce us around? We want him to know that thing. When he puts his hand on the wheel, we want him to feel every single movement that plane makes. That, dads, is how well we should know our kids and our grandkids. That is what God calls us to do. I wish I'd done that better. I wish I'd done that better. But if you wonder what godly calling for your children are, is, that's it. Some of us say, man, this is a scary world we live in. What what if I mess this up? Well, this is not mine. I wish it was. Hang on. As a parent, here's what I want you to think about. Don't feel sorry or fear for your kids because the world they're going to grow up in is not what it used to be. God created them and called them for the exact moment in time that they are in. Their life is not a coincidence or an accident. They're here for a reason. Raise them to walk in the power of victory that they have as a child of God. Train them up to love His Word. To respect it. To respect the authority of it. Teach them to walk in the faith to know that God is in control. I don't run this thing. God does. Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by the world and what it looks like and how it is. But that the truth of the gospel will stand. Every single person in history has been placed in the time they're in because of God's sovereign plan. And we won't talk about sovereignty a lot. And we throw that word around. And Keith and I sometimes refer to it as the S word. But to be honest with you, if you want to talk about sovereignty, you've got to understand that's what this is. Every person in history has been placed in the time they're in because of God's sovereign plan. Listen to this. God knew Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew David could handle Goliath. He knew Esther could handle Haman. He knew Peter could handle the persecution. Whatever the challenge that your child will face in life, if they are following in God's footsteps and they are following in the will that he has preceded for them, that he created them for, They'll be okay. Don't be scared for your kids, our kids. God chose you to parent that child. He chose you. This generation faces some of the toughest challenges in history. We know that. Just ask God to give you the courage to face it. We say it all the time. God is not sitting around scratching his head wondering what's going to happen in this world. It's not happening. Don't let fear steal the greatness God has placed in your child. It's hard to imagine them as anything other than just your baby. And you won't protect them from this world, but you, again, are not raising children. You're raising adults for a purpose in a time created for this. And God's basically giving you the task. The question is, do you want to accept it? Last thing, anger. Why does he talk about anger? I tried my best to just, just... blow right through this and say, done. 
in six, in, in, it says, do not, do not provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline of the Lord, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why didn't he say don't discourage or don't pamper them or don't tempt them into doing things or don't lie or steal or don't abuse them or don't neglect them or don't set a bad example for them? Why does he say this? Well, there's a couple reasons maybe. I don't know. Anger is the most common emotion of the sinful heart when it confronts authority. That's a piperism too. I didn't like that at all. Anger is the most common emotion of a sinful heart when it confronts authority. Dad is authority. Apart from Christ, our children, when they come into this world wanting to do what they want to do. We don't have to teach them. It's part of who they are. And when sometimes those two clash, you got a two-year-old that throws a tantrum, you got a teenager that slams a door. Or worse. So Paul might be saying here, there may be plenty of anger with the best of parenting, so let's do everything we can without compromising our authority, without compromising our truth, to provoke any anger. We have to know our kids. We have to know what sets them off. All kids are different. I'm going to tell us one story, and then we're going to be done. Some of you have heard this story. Those of you who have not, I'm going to apologize, but it is what it is. My two daughters could not have been any different if I tried. When Melanie was little, I could cross my eyes at her and she'd melt that's just all there was to it I mean I could wilt her like a flower in the sun Aaron on the other hand was different they were fighting one day coming home in a car from home, from Taylorsville and they got in this fight and I said stop 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 no we need, need to fight we need to settle this I, Melanie's probably nine Aaron's probably seven well probably ten and seven something like that they kept on I finally just turned around and I said I'm not going to ask you again stop Melanie, why don't you just let us fight and get this over with? I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you fight. When you get done, when we get home, okay, judge me if you want to. I said, I'm going to bust that hind end. If you want to fight, that's fine, but you're going to pay the piper. I didn't say another word. Next thing I knew, the hair was flying, and it was just awful. So there wasn't another word said for about 15 minutes. We pulled in the development there at, in Wilkesboro. About the time we got into the driveway of the development, Old sis there, she started with the waterworks. Daddy, don't whip us. Daddy, don't whip us. Please, Daddy, don't whip us. Aaron hadn't said a word. Got in our own driveway, and when I made that right-hand turn, she started that incline dog screaming, started, Daddy, please don't whip it. Daddy, please, please don't whip it. Daddy. Got to the carport, stopped that car. Doors flew open. Melanie's laid up against the wall over there. She's in the fetal position now. Daddy, please don't give us a whipping. Aaron disappeared through the house. I'm talking to Melanie and explaining to it, and I thought, where is that girl? Where is Aaron? I turn around and look. Glass score coming through the door. There comes my youngest daughter carrying a belt. She opened that door. She looked at me. She took me by the hand. She took that belt. She slapped that thing in my hand. She looked at me, and she said, let's get this over with. That's a true story. That's how different they can be. Dads, we have to know how to deal with all that. Now, some of you are going to say, how'd you do that, Fry? We'll have to talk later. <laughs> may or may not have made some mistakes in that one. I'm just saying. When you're a young parent and you're a little aggravated and a seven-year-old challenges your authority, God's forgiven and thankful for that. We have to know the difference. Don't provoke them to anger. Paul knows that if a dad can help a child not be overcome by anger, because think about it, some of the worst decisions we've ever made in our lives have, become, have come when we're mad, right? I mean, we say stuff when we're mad that we don't say other times. It, it basically blocks out all other emotions. So maybe Paul's saying, look, if you learn how to not provoke your children to anger, they may understand the other emotions you want them to be filled with. Joy, love, kindness, compassion. They'll be open to that instead of anger and where it overcomes and overwhelms everything. I'm going to say this and I'm going to stop. God has never done anything ever to legitimately cause anger in any of his children. Think about that. 
We just sung a song. He's a good, good father. But if we think about it, if God's in control and he's sovereign and he's in authority, he's never done anything that we legitimately could be mad at him over. There's some things that hurt us. Why did so-and-so die? Why does this happen? Why did I look? I, I get all that. But if he's in control and he's sovereign and he wants what's best for us, what he says is, come to me and ask the questions. Replace the anger with joy. Don't just stop provoking your kids to anger, but start doing the things that increases the other emotions and the other personality traits that you're looking for. Invest. The gospel is the key. One of Keith's favorite verses is Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. God forgave me, God forgave you. In Christ, by the Spirit, dads, you can do this. Moms, you can do this. And I'm going to leave you with this little phrase, and this is the, uh, I'm just going to take, uh, you know. If only parents had the capacity to love kids like grandparents love grandbabies, this world, this world would be a better place. See, grandparents, just like I admitted to you a little while ago, see, we've made the mistakes. We've had the ability to look back over time and look over those frosty mornings and say, I could have done that better. Wish I'd have done that differently. So if you've got a godly mom or dad who's you're going to make a grandparent or have made a grandparent, and they look at you and say, hey, let, let me just offer this to you. Don't throw it away immediately. We might know what fights to pick. We might know where to draw the line. We might know when to lower our voice a little bit and speak softly instead of raising our voices. Number one for me, number one. I know this comes as a shock to you, but at times our house got really loud and it was my fault. James Dobson said, if it's not life issues, if it's not going to affect them when they're adults. You know what? Another example. I don't know, Kim can help me. From the time Erin Fry's been six, maybe, maybe seven, I don't know that she's ever worn a pair of matching socks. Ever. Ever. Drove her mama crazy. Literally drove her crazy. And then Dobson said one day, it's not a big deal. It's really not. If she's a com kind, compassionate, loving person to other people with unmatched socks, who really cares? Now, if it's lying and stealing and all that stuff, you got to draw that line. But if it's stuff like her sh clothes don't match or, you know, she wants to do her hair and it looks really weird, it's okay. It's okay. Unfolded clothes and messy rooms are not the end of the world. If you want to say, I need you to clean this up, that's okay. I'm not saying you can't do that. But old Paul knew what he was talking about when he said life is like a vapor. There are several of us in here with grandkids that would look at you and say, man, you have no idea how quick this goes. And I can say this to your parents. You get one shot. That's it. And as soon as you know it, it's over. Seek the wisdom of godly counsel. Seek the wisdom of God's word. Do the best you can. And he'll bless you for it. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your goodness and your grace, the uh, ability and opportunity to be in your word today, Father. And we say, uh, pray that you would uh, challenge us. Uh, God, that you'd make us candidates for change, that everything that we do and say would lift you up. Father, I pray for these parents and us as grandparents and as we prepare these kids and grandkids for us, a world and a culture that's unlike anything we've ever seen. To, to believe in the truth that you created them for this time, that you created them for this purpose. But we still have to put in the work, Lord. We still have to, to be present. We still have to be committed. We still have to do what we need to do that you've asked us to do, that you've called us to do. Give us the ability to understand that. For those that are not here today, Father, we ask you to be with them as they travel, as they enjoy some time off. 
God, then as we come back next week, Lord, we look into your word again. That everything that's said and done today and through this week would lift up and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.